One wintry day in 1860, a man by the name of Edward Spencer was walking along the shore of Lake Michigan. He watched helplessly as a steamship crossing the lake was rammed by a freighter. There were some 360 passengers on the steamship, and as it began to sink, Edward, an accomplished swimmer, jumped into the water and swam out to where the people were floundering and sinking and dying to rescue those passengers. He grabbed one and swam to shore. He was able to make 17 trips, but only were able to rescue 17 people out of the over 360 that were in the water. These were the only ones to survive, just 17 out of 360. Edward never got over the deaths of the other 340 people. In fact, he blamed himself for those deaths, even though he had swung out until he was exhausted. His inability to rescue more caused him to enter a period of depression and despair. He quit college, and a few years later was admitted to an asylum. A journalist decided to do a story on Spencer. He sought him out. When he located him in the asylum, that he, he, he was confined to a wheelchair. The journalist learned that none of the 17 that he had rescued ever came back to thank you. That was the most indelible impression on Spencer's mind throughout those many years. No one came to say thank you for saving my life. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, the very beginning of that verse, do not be anxious about anything. So what's Paul saying? He's not saying we shouldn't care. We should care for people. We should care for what God thinks and wants of us. It shouldn't be the most important thing in our lives. There are so many things that the world wants us to get anxious about. We get upset when our plans are altered, when our schedules are interrupted by, by something unexpected. I drove up to L.A. Monday afternoon. And it was three and a half hours to get to Burbank for the NAM assessment retreat for Obed and Element. Once time to leave on Wednesday afternoon, I was finished at 5.30. I said, you know what? It's probably going to take me three and a half hours to get back to San Diego. Nine o'clock, I got to the house. Three and a half hours later. Now, my, huh? My GPS, my GPS told me to make some alterations to I-5 as I was coming back down. And, you know, you get to that bottleneck where the 10 and the 60 and the 5 meet, and there's just no way you're going through that fast, and I didn't. Later on down, I said, take 605s. Why not? Get off of the 505. Why not? Take the toll road. Why not? Yeah, that was fast. Still took three and a half hours. Mm. So much for my schedule. There is nothing usually that we can do about interruptions to our schedules. Remember how traffic coming back from the memorial service was rerouted into the water main break on Mission Bay Drive on Monday? And we kept wondering where everybody else was because some of us got here without any problems. Did you get anxious about getting to the church in time for the fellowship? Were you worried that there wouldn't be any food left? What, with Doris in charge? Nah. When Doris organizes a potluck, there's always enough and more, isn't there? We shouldn't get anxious about things that are out of our hands. Things over which we have no control. We should trust God because He's in control. 
Nothing ever surprises God. He never says, well, I didn't know that. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus and his disciples were on their way. And he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, he answered. You're worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha was asking Jesus to give her sister an order. Tell her to help me out, she pleaded. Which is more important? The worship of Jesus or work for Jesus. To be careful for nothing means to be full of care. It's akin to our word worry. Worry literally means to be pulled in different directions. It comes from a German word, worgen, which means to strangle or to choke us. Worry means we have more faith in our problems than our problem solving. The solution is to focus on God, not on our problems. And then Paul continues in the rest of verse 4 by saying this, But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The word prayer comes from a combination of three Greek words. The first is pro, which means to be in front of. And then you add the letter S to that, which means forward or toward. And eukomai, which means to will or to wish. Prayer is an opportunity to turn our faces toward God and present to Him what we will or wish. And when we do, we shouldn't be doing it just once or twice. It's to be a continually continual thing. We turn our faces to God again and again. And as we do that, we need to learn to give thanks in anything. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Giving thanks is an act of my will. I make the choice of whether or not I will give thanks. <clears throat> Every one of us has the option of whether or not we will or will not demonstrate our thankfulness to God. Feeling thankful is an issue of my emotions. My emotions can lead me to make mistakes. There are times when I feel thankful, and there are times when I don't feel thankful. Each of us must decide which of these will control us. Let me point out that the more mature we are, the more we will not let our emotions control us, but rather will be controlled by our will. Each of us goes through trials in our lives. These trials will either make us bitter or better. Again, it's a matter of choice. We choose with our will whether we will become bitter because of something that challenges us or we will become better because of that challenge. As we head into that storm with the Lord's leading and the Holy Spirit's presence, we have a choice. Will we be bitter or will we be better? James chapter 1 verse 2 tells us, Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Sometimes our reaction is just the opposite. Trials are not fun. They can be hurtful. They can be painful. They can cause us anxiety. We can lose sleep over them. Or we can trust the Lord with all of our hearts and not lean on our own understanding. We don't always have the Lord's perspective on our trials. We, we don't always have a complete understanding about why our trials are happening. We don't know the end when we're at the beginning. But the Lord knows it all from beginning to end already. And because we don't have the Lord's perspective on our trials, on our testing, you know he's going to be with you through the trial, 
through the test. So just get on with it to see why it's going to happen when you get to the end of it. Remember Job? Did Job understand his trials? Why all this, Why everything in chapter 1 happened? No, he didn't. Did his friends? No. For 40 chapters, none of them understood the point of Job's trials. In his lifetime, did he understand? Even in chapter 42, when he went to the Lord and the Lord said, You know what? Have you ever measured the stars? Have you ever created? No. Job never learned why he went through those trials in his lifetime. But after he died and went to heaven, maybe then he could understand why. Only God knows from beginning to end why. We have trials and testings. And sometimes he never answers that question, why, Lord? Because he asks us just to trust him, that he's going to take care of it from beginning to end, and it will be for his glory. Did Paul understand why the Lord didn't remove his thorn in the side? Not in his lifetime. Nevertheless, both Job and Paul gave God the glory and gave God the praise for the trials that they were put through. And when we're challenged by trials and testing, God expects us to do the same thing. Are you ready to give thanks today? Will you still be able to give thanks on Thursday, kind of like that family in the video at the beginning of the movie, who found, finally, with the voice of a child, an opportunity to pause and give thanks for all of the blessings they had. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we need to remember to give thanks in the words of the song writer with a grateful heart. We need to remember to give thanks to the Holy One for what He has done through Jesus Christ, His Son. We need to remember that when we are weakest and dependent on you, we are strong. <laughs> when we feel poor, poor in spirit, the presence of Christ and your Holy Spirit enrich us. As Paul has said, Father, give thanks on all occasions, all times. In rushing around for the next few days, for the cooking and the baking and supplies that are needed for the gathering of family and many friends, may we not be anxious. Instead, Heavenly Father, may we be thankful and praise you for giving us Jesus Christ, your Son, to be our Savior. May we, Heavenly Father, give thanks in his name I pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 312. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling you. Calling you to turn your heart back to Him, because that's where it's home, is back to Him. Calling for you to 
commit yourself, maybe recommit yourself to Him again. That you might serve Him and praise Him and thank Him in all your circumstances and situations. Let's sing together, won't be at the front, if God's Holy Spirit is moving you to make a decision, come share that.